the quality of an actor's work on screen might be a matter of opinion most of the time, but there are some performances so awful that all subjectivity goes out the window. In the case of these scenes, the acting is so over the top and bizarre that it's hard not to laugh at them even years after the fact. Talk about sucking. Just about everyone involved in the adaptation of Stephanie Meyer's vampire romance could be accused of phoning it in, but Twilight's MVP, Kristen Stewart, takes top honors for worst performance in the movie's climactic scene. It all starts when a trio of nomadic vamps lurk around looking for something to eat when they stumble across the Cullen clan playing baseball while their protected human pet watches on. A standoff ensues and almost ends peacefully before James catches a whiff of Bella and gets the munchies. You brought a snack. The situation is diffused, but not done. James, the tracker vampire, vows to hunt her down and eat her. Despite the Cullens' best efforts to hide her, he lures her away from the Cullens and savagely snaps her leg. Bella's sparkly vampire boyfriend Edward arrives to save her from certain death, but James still manages to sink his teeth into her arm. The venom from his bite starts to spread through her veins right away, which is when she informed everyone. In Maya's book, the pain is described as, quote, exquisite. But watching Stuart's grunting and grimacing in the moment makes those tiny teeth marks look anything but. The nose knows. Richard Linklater's coming-of-age classic Dazed and Confused gave us the gift of many quotable Matthew McConaughey moments. <laughs> you just gotta keep living, man. L-I-V-I-N. But it's also responsible for the unbearable nuisance of Mitch Kramer. The Goober Freshman is a categorical case study in social awkwardness, so there's some lack of screen savvy to be expected from his portrayal. But in the scene where he's trying to flirt with Sabrina outside the Emporium, it's full tilt amateur hour. Instead of coming out with traditional acting devices like facial expressions, vocal inflection, or pure presence, actor Wiley Wiggins relied on eight, yes, eight, cringe-worthy nose grabs. Five hair flips. What are you doing here? They just been doing. Can I ask? And one super clumsy elbow nudge to coast through the scene. Linklater eventually accepted responsibility for letting this bad slip through the editing cracks, telling The Daily Beast, I just thought the nose grab was kind of an awkward gesture. I'm the director, so it's on me. That's the thing people notice only if it's the third time you watch it. I just thought it was that young, awkward man kind of thing. Maybe it was one or two too many. When it comes to removing a few of those nose grabs, maybe on a remastered cut of the movie, well, It'd be a lot cooler if you did. Pass the turkey. Considering G. Lee is a movie whose 6% Rotten Tomatoes score is probably a little generous, there are a lot of awful aspects to choose from. You know something? You're right. It is sadness. It's sadness and I'm sad. The stupidity of this thing extends all the way up to the title itself, so it's a tall order to pick just one scene as the worst of the worst. Since Geely was such a turkey at the box office though, it makes sense to focus on the scene that tried, and failed miserably, to make Thanksgiving themed cuisine a workable piece of sexy dialogue. In the movie, Jennifer Lopez plays a lesbian named Ricky, who decides to make Ben Affleck's hitman her boy toy and invites him into her bed, like so. It's turkey time. Huh? That's when everyone watching this movie did this. The turkey talk is an evergreen highlight for both Ben and Jen's career blooper reels, even though they've tried to put the picture into perspective ever since. Yeah, there's worse movies than Geely out there. The Empty Box. With all due respect to Brad Pitt, his performance in Seven is a classic case of an actor completely missing the emotional mark of an important movie moment. Instead of delivering on what might have been a powerful scene, he made a bit of a mockery of himself. To be fair to Pitt, he was working with three industry giants, director David Fincher and actors Kevin Spacey and Morgan Freeman. While he was still something of a Hollywood newcomer at the time, but compared to everyone else's delivery in the wrath scene, his contribution is pretty inexcusable. 
In the grand finale of John Doe's Deadly Sins inspired plan, Kevin Spacey's killer character leads the detective duo out to the desert to find a package containing… something. Freeman's character gets a gander at it first and his face dutifully reflects the grim reality of the situation. We're led to believe it's the head of Mill's pregnant wife Tracy, an innocent and lovely lady who has nothing to do with any of this mess, but we never get to see the contents. The tension is staggering until Pitt starts screaming his lines and jumping around like a carnival clown. I saw you with the box! What was in the box? What's in the box? Not till you give me the What's gun. in the box? It's a scene ruiner upon re-watching it. Looking back, you might be tempted to believe it was secretly Pitt's talent that was actually hidden in the box. Those bloody wolves. If Keanu Reeves could really take a Bill & Ted style journey back in time, we hope he'd at least consider returning to the early 90s and undoing everything he did in Bram Stoker's Dracula. At the very least, he should retroactively hire himself a proper dialect coach because his British accent is so horrible that it actually distracts viewers from fixating on Gary Oldman's giant butt wig, which is quite a feat. In one scene in particular, Reeves' character starts to realise that the count is bad news and delivers a recap of his Transylvanian adventures that's way funnier than it's supposed to be. I've seen many strange things already. Bloody wolves chasing me through some blue inferno. Even director Francis Ford Coppola, who's practically president of the Keanu Reeves fan club, had to admit to Entertainment Weekly it was tough for him to affect an English accent. He tried so hard. That was the problem, actually. He wanted to do it perfectly, and in trying to do it perfectly, it came off as stilted. In other words, I doubted everything, even my mind. I was impotent with fear. The Fumble 1999 presented two major movie moments depicting sons rejecting their stodgy old dad's wishes for them to follow in their footsteps. And one of those things was not like the other. Jake Gyllenhaal's breakthrough performance as Homer Hickman in October Sky features him standing up to the status quo of going to the mineshaft after school with his dad. Instead, he literally reaches for the sky as a wannabe space cadet who built rockets on the sly. It builds to a poignant moment of father-son friction that totally resonates the way it should. Coleman's your life. It's not mine. Compare that to James Van Der Beek's showdown with his own pop in Varsity Blues, which hit theaters a few weeks before. In the movie, Van Der Beek plays a backup high school quarterback named Mox, who's hiked his way to the starting squad after an injury takes out the team's original star. Somehow, this ignites some long-held dream his dad has for Mox to become the star player. But Mox has no such ambitions and tells him as much, in the most exaggerated and terrible accent imaginable. Playing football at West Canaan may have been the opportunity of your lifetime, but I don't want your life. It's hard to tell whether it's the dull delivery tone or the lines themselves that make this such a dud, but he gets no points for that scene. Green Boblin James Franco made a jump to the blockbuster A-list with Sam Raimi's Spider-Man trilogy, but it's also a regular go-to source for some of his most accidentally lousy acting moments. His character spends the first sequel desperately seeking the web-slinging vigilante who he believes killed his dad in the first film. And when he lifts the mask to reveal Spidey's identity, he discovers his best friend, Peter Parker, is his new worst enemy. No. Can't be. Franco's slack-jawed gape and awkward footwork is only exceeded in badness by his whispered threats about getting payback. If only I could cause you the pain that you've caused me. The whole thing adds up to a scene more cartoonish than the comics it was based on. Rain, rain, go away. Andy McDowell never quite lived up to the promise she displayed in movies from the late 80s and early 90s. Maybe it was because of her wooden performance in Four Weddings and a Funeral. I don't usually skulk a lot, but I suppose I could skulk if skulking were required. Although the film is otherwise moderately charming, there's one scene that tends to ruin it on every rewatch. At the end of the movie, in the pouring rain, Hugh Grant delivers one of those classic sappy, it was you all along speeches to McDowell, but his monologue is interrupted by one very pointless observation. Is it still raining? I hadn't noticed. There's so little emotion in the moment from McDowell, 
that it's almost as if she were the funeral featured in the film's title. Thanks for watching. Click the looper icon to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Plus, check out all this cool stuff we know you'll love too.